Good. Thank, thank you very much. Um, we are being joined by members online at home, so, and I will encourage the speakers to speak into this microphone or they will not hear us. Um, but I'd like to begin by asking the secretary to read the minutes from the last meeting. The seventh meeting of the 129th season took place at the Society of Antiquaries, Burlington House, Piccadilly, London, and online via Zoom on Tuesday, the 17th of May. Professor James Raven, president, was in the chair. After the minutes of the previous meeting had been read and signed, the president introduced Professor Arthur Marks, who delivered the 2022 Homi and Firozi Randiria lecture entitled Nathaniel Price, a sometime blind bookbinder. When the meeting was open to discussion, the following took part. Professor Miriam Foote, Professor Nicholas Pickwood, Mr. James Asher, Ms. Robin Myers, and Mr. Giles Mandelbrot. The president closed the meeting by thanking Professor Marks warmly for his paper. Thank you very much, Karen. Is this an accurate record? This is the first time with a new president. We're just getting into sync here, you think. <laughs> it's very green and it takes time. Um, I would like to welcome everyone here today and joining us online, our speakers, members of the society, guests, and members of council who have patiently met earlier this afternoon with a new green president in the chair slowly finding his way. Um, our program this afternoon will consist of short presentations, about 15 minutes each, from three recipients of research awards given by the society. This is the second time we have hosted a panel of speakers. It was a great success last year, and I have no doubt that it will be this year as well. A gathering like this allows us to meet personally some of the scholars we have supported and hear about a wide variety of interesting and important subjects. Variety, after all, is the spice of life. The range today is from Tudor England to Catholic printed books in the Protestant Dutch Republic, and then fast forward to modernist small press publishing in the early 20th century. Let me now briefly introduce our th three speakers together in the order that they will speak. Um, at the end, there will be uh, an opportunity for discussion and questions. Um, I would ask that anyone in the room asking a question to wait until they are given by Karen the microphone or otherwise people in, online will not be able to, to hear us. Uh, for those of you joining us online, if you have questions, please use the chat function. Dr. Elise Watson is a postdoctoral researcher at the, university, at the Universal Short Title Catalog Project at the University of St. Andrews, where she works on data related to early modern France and the Low Countries. Her PhD, completed in 2022, documented the clandestine Catholic book trade in the Dutch Republic, examining how the availability of print shaped the minority uh, religious experience. She has been published in Studies in Church History 2021, Brill's Library of the Written Word series, and she is currently developing her thesis into a monograph entitled Print and Catholic Perseverance in the Dutch Golden Age. Uh, today, she will speak on seditious and scandalous books crossing borders in the Low Countries. Our next speaker will be Tim Wade, uh, who is currently a college lecturer in history and Julian Schild Jr. Research Fellow at Pembroke College, Oxford. He recently completed his doctorate, a large bibliographical survey of the readers of the, of the great Dutch humanist writer Desiderius Erasmus. Today, he will talk about the library of the Tudor scholar and diplomat, Sir John Mason. Our third speaker, is Dr. Evie Heinz, a postdoctoral research associate in book studies at the University of Munster in Germany. Her research interests broadly encompass modernist literature and material culture, with a particular focus on modernist publishing history and periodical print culture. Her publications in this area include a co-authored chapter on modernist publishers' archives, in the forthcoming Bloomsbury Handbook of Modernism in the Archive, 
<clears throat> and her current research on Harriet Shaw Weaver's egoist press forms part of a larger project on modernist small press publishers in London during the 1910s and 20s, which seeks to situate this amateur publishing practice within the wider creative and economic networks of the contemporary book world. Today, she will talk about the egoist press and the network of modernist print. Let me hand over to Elise. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. On the 5th of September, 1671, Balthazar III Moretus was setting off on his first ever business trip. At 25 years old, he was finally going to represent his family business, the Plant and Moretus printing firm, abroad. Balthazar III was traveling from his native, piously Catholic Antwerp in the Southern Netherlands to the Dutch Republic, its prosperous and conspicuously Protestant neighbor. Unluckily for Balthazar, he arrived to find absolute chaos. This is not just because the Dutch were about to be invaded by the French and also kill and eat their grand pensionary a year later. In fact, he'd come to the Dutch Republic to settle a number of debts with Dutch booksellers who collectively owned the firm tens of thousands of guilders. Things were not going to go well for Balthazar. And things are not going well for me, unless I can get this slide to move. <laughs> Of the 35 booksellers and seven merchants he visited, many had since died, leaving the debt to their heirs, and several were bankrupt. Two separate booksellers had fled to the Indies to escape their debt, one leaving his wife behind in Emmerich. One client of the firm had even ended up in debtor's prison, and Balthazar actually went and bailed him out. Balthazar traveled around, trying to find widows, sons, and grandsons to hold to account for these debts, um, for the book. Some of the books were ordered 10 or 20 years before. Eventually, he must have given up since by the end of September 1671, you see his travel expenditure go down and his ale expenditure go up. We know all of this because Balthazar recorded every detail of his trip precisely in his travel journal, which is preserved in the Plant and Moretus Museum today. He kept a detailed list of accounts, um, interactions, and expenditures. Charmingly, you can see here that his father, Balthazar II, uh, for his son's first business trip, included a list of formulas at the back of the book for how to write receipts. And we know it was him personally by his hand. We also know from this that Balthazar II had his son list every expense and save every receipt so that he could submit them upon his return. So the next time you have to submit a receipt for reimbursement, just think about it as participating in a 351-year-old tradition. As you can probably tell from the way Balthazar Jr. prepared for this trip, the firm was expecting this chaos. The Dutch Republic had been a headache for many years for two directly contradictory reasons. The primary product that the Plant and Moretus firm sold were books of Catholic liturgy. These were functionally illegal in the Dutch Republic, formally classified as seditious and scandalous works by the States General. Despite this, they could not get Catholic and Protestant printers alike to stop counterfeiting them. My research at the Plant and Moretus Museum this past summer, generously funded by the Bibliographical Society, revealed a prolific but also complicated and dramatic relationship between the firm and its Dutch clients. In the time I have left, I'll take you through what I found and describe how these books crossed geographical and confessional borders. This will be separated into three sections. First, I'll provide a bit more detail on the Dutch clients of the planted Moretus and what they looked like. Then I'll discuss the intricacies of buying and selling Catholic books between the Catholic Southern and Protestant Northern Netherlands. Finally, I'll show you where this trade ended up, which is in steep decline due to the precipitous rise of false imprints and counterfeits. This trade demonstrates two things. First, it shows that these seditious and scandalous books had enormous value. Far from being a diminishing minority book trade, Catholic books were a highly sought after commodity for Catholic and Protestant booksellers alike. Merchants and booksellers of all faiths capitalized on their value, helping the Plant and Moretus firm ship them to Spain and selling them or their counterfeits in their own shops. 
Secondly, this popularity and ubiquity of Plantin Moretus editions led to the name and mention of Antwerp on the title page of these books to be associated with a sense of Catholic piety. By the end of the 17th century, Dutch printers had mastered the art of either directly counterfeiting their books to imitate works from the Plantin Moretus or simply falsely imprinting their books as being from Antwerp. This created what I've been calling a pious brand, a clever marketing strategy that allowed them to capitalize on this trade with the mise en page of their own products, leading to the decline of this trade overall. A room full of book historians hardly needs an explanation of how exceptional the Plantin Moretus firm was, but I'll give you one anyway, just in case. In the 16th century, Christoph Plantin and his apprentice and son-in-law, Jan Moretus, set up the most formidable print empire in all of Europe in the city of Antwerp in what is now Belgium. For centuries, they held a monopoly granted by the Pope on the printing of several different works of Catholic liturgy. They supplied this liturgy to all of Catholic Europe, particularly Spain, and these editions became famous for their rich illustrations and vast range of sizes, from the Plantin Polyglot Bible in eight folio volumes, which required 13 presses and 55 pressmen to produce, to this almost impossibly tiny calendar printed in 128 bow. I know, seriously. From this flowchart created by the Plantin Moretus archivist Christoph Selleslach, you can see how meticulously the firm preserved its sale records. I use this to create a master list of every single Dutch printer, bookseller, merchant, organization, and individual buyer that had any interaction with the Plantin Moretus. All in all, this ended up being 25 of these individual ledgers between 1579 and 1723, ranging in length from about 20 leaves in octavo to 400 leaves in folio, as well as 10 more volumes not in this chart. I found that these were very human ledgers. They're full of scraps of waste paper, scribbled receipts, and bits of print covered in sums and calculations in the hands of various master printers and publishers. In these 35 ledgers, I found 300 distinct accounts of publishers, booksellers, merchants, and others trading with the firm. This included 225 booksellers, 62 merchants, three organizations, and 10 individual clients, mostly clergy. Uh, for a semi-clandestine book trade, those are pretty remarkable numbers, and I don't have time in this presentation to break um, this down any further, but you're welcome to ask me about it in the Q&A. Before I go any further, though, I should take a brief moment to talk about the actual legality of this trade. Catholics in the Dutch Republic operated in a curious set of circumstances. Though the 1579 Union of Utrecht granted them the freedom to believe whatever they wanted privately, they were forbidden from practicing their faith publicly or holding public office, creating this strange dichotomy of private permission and public censorship. Despite this, they remained a large and affluent minority. You can see this from the ostentatious and elaborate house churches they built. Books worked exactly the same way. In 1581, the States General of the United Provinces of the Netherlands released an edict banning off offensive, seditious, and scandalous books, and at the same time officially declared that the practice of Roman Catholicism was a seditious and scandalous crime, using precisely the same wording. In a country with famously lax book censorship, this meant that Catholic print was prohibited entirely by implication. These records provide incredibly detailed descriptions of how these books crossed borders. Books were exchanged for linen, jewelry, reams of valuable paper, and other books. Books were also sent on credit, with a local business partner of the firm vouching for the credibility of the individual seller. This firm, I found, was also remarkably dependent on Protestant merchants shipping their books elsewhere, mostly Spain. At the end of the 17th century, there was one independent female merchant in Middleburg, Katharina Kiel, controlling the shipping, without whom I think this firm could probably not have survived. And this is another thing you should ask me about in the Q&A. I also found that there was a booming trade of prohibited books that was part of this. Booksellers in Amsterdam would send books to the Plantin Moretus as payment that were on the index of prohibited books, presumably valuable clients for a special clientele. Here you see a pre-Adamite book, very heretical, being sold by the Amsterdam bookseller Joachim van Metelen back to the firm, in addition to other things like linen and parchment. The preserved correspondences of multiple generations of Moretuses 
also reveal close personal and professional relationships. Planting Moreta's printers bought liturgical books from Dutch printers at precisely the same time they sold them their own. Dutch booksellers would also sell books to clients that the firm had in the Dutch Republic. On the 17th of December, 1683, one Amsterdam bookseller notes, quote, these few lines will then serve as an answer that, according to request, I will send the Hague resident a breviary in 18 tomorrow. In their letters, they also exchanged news and gossip about what was going on in the Dutch printing industry. Printers kept the firm informed of what liturgical books Dutch printers were producing, in what format, how many volumes, and how many illustrations. In the same letter, the pre the pr this printer, Frederick van Metelen, wrote a postscript as his servant arrived home, telling him, quote, my servant came home to my side to tell me that Blau is currently printing a missile in small folio, all together with new plates, also a breviary in 12, or Denise Minorum, and his concordance will be out in March in octavo. He followed up in a letter written on the 28th of February, 1684, frustrated about the attention Blau's breviary was getting. Quote, his breviaries can do great harm as the Lords of Holland do not otherwise seek breviaries because our bishop enjoys special privileges there, he wrote. Some Dutch publishers even tried to get the firm to print Catholic texts that they themselves could not. In 1643, an Amsterdam Catholic printer, Hendrik Berenson, asked Balthazar II to print a political text for him that was critical of the Dutch government. Balthazar Sr. was clearly uneasy about this and tried to avoid it, saying, quote, for I have since been thinking that if it must be printed in complete secrecy, this cannot be done in my printing office, where every day, chiefly in the summer, about the time of the coming fair, many strangers, Dutchmen too, come to look around. Indeed, that very summer, he was hosting the wife and daughter of a Dutch reformed bookseller. The firm's commitment to its interconfessional inter clientele was essential, which is interesting considering they produced almost entirely liturgical books. This trade also meant that these books were imitated and counterfeited quickly by Dutch publishers. In these correspondences, the various Moretuses who ran the firm would express frustration with how counterfeit publishing was impacting their business. At the same time as Dutch printers were buying books, some of the firm's biggest clients were also counterfeiting and undercutting them. The greatest perpetrator of this was the Blau family, Willem and his son Joan of Atlas fame. Jon Blau hired a retired Jesuit to act as his proofreader and overseer and to ensure that his Catholic works were licit and orthodox. He even traveled to Rome himself in the 1640s to obtain imprimaturs and expurgations for his pre-publication manuscripts of Catholic books. Not bad for a remonstrant son of a Mennonite. In fact, he was so successful in printing Catholic books that when his print shop caught fire in 1672, Reformed ministers in the city said it was divine providence. The firm wrote all of these pirates angry letters, but was essentially powerless to stop them, especially since they were also some of their biggest clients. This setup also bothered the Reformed consistory greatly, who registered with the city council in 1626 their displeasure about, quote, the glory of the papists abroad that such books are being printed in Amsterdam. To be fair, I should say that Catholic booksellers were profiting from this brand just as much. However, they focused less on pretending to be the Plantin Moretus and more about emulating features of its design, including elaborately engraved title pages and imprints that featured Antwerp prominently. These false imprints were generally an aesthetic choice rather than an act of self-censorship. You can tell they weren't actually concerned about being censored by how brazen the vast majority of them are. As you can see here, printers such as the Harlem printer Klaas Brau shamelessly kept his own printer's device and even the location of his shop in the imprint while switching out the city in which it was supposedly printed. This was a transparent and obvious deception and it was only made possible by the ubiquity of Plantin Moretus books. Here you can see three variant issues of the same edition of a Catholic work by three Dutch printers two in Amsterdam and one in Harlem that preserve this Antwerp identity throughout. From the research I was able to do in the Plantin Moretus, thanks to the Bibliographical Society, it became clear that trade with the firm benefited Dutch printers and booksellers of all confessions. For Catholic booksellers, they could satisfy their clientele and receive the books of their faith. They could also cultivate a friendship with a powerful bookseller by feeding him information about the trade. 
For Protestant booksellers, they could easily make enormous profit by reselling these books or counterfeiting them or doing both. What was not clear is that these commercial relationships really benefited the Plantin Moretus firm at all, other than the merchants who shipped their books. According to Leon Voot, curator of the Plantin Moretus for more than 30 years, clients from the Dutch Republic never made up more than 20% of total foreign buyers and never cracked 10% of the firm's total exports. And as we heard at the beginning, Dutch book booksellers could order a number of expensive books and escape paying them entirely by disappearing, dying, passing the business on, or fleeing to the Indies. What is most scandalous of all, in my opinion, is that Plantin Moretus headache or not, these books continue to cross borders between North and South, and Catholic and Protestant, year after year, a testament to their value, both material and immaterial. Thank you. Load up my presentation. Oh, up we go. Wonderful. Well, thanks everyone um, so much for being here, and I, and I wanted to just extend um, uh, a big thank you from me um, for the support from the Society for this project. Um, and also, um, I wanted to thank the librarians of All Souls College Oxford uh, and of Winchester Cathedral, Gay Morgan and Eleanor Swire, um, who have been extremely helpful in, in uh, helping me with, uh, with this project. And indeed, uh, to Richard Foster, the fellow librarian of Winchester College, who's offered his expertise and advice on the Cathedral Library, and I'm extremely grateful to all three of them for the, for the help that they've given. Um, so as my title makes clear, um, I've been investigating the library of uh, Sir John Mason, and Mason is one uh, of the most intriguing characters of the mid-Tudor period. Born in 1503 uh, to humble parents, his intellectual promise saw him uh, quickly sent to Oxford in the 1520s, where he became a fellow of All Souls College in 1521. And though it was originally intended uh, for the priesthood, his talents soon recommended him to figures within Henry VIII's government. Um, and he was shortly sent to Paris on a royal exhibition um, and thereafter uh, served on a series of foreign missions. And I'll uh, give you a sense of the biography here. Um, and Mason, after this sort of rapid rise at university and then into foreign service, um, he went on to serve as a secretary counselor and diplomat uh, to each of Henry VIII's children um, uh, and died in 1566, a wealthy man. Now, behind this uh, seemingly s smooth rise had been a series of crises. As a young man, Mason had moved in the circles of two prominent English students, Reginald Poole and Richard Pate. And both Poole and Pate in the 1530s were to make dramatic defections to Rome against Henry VIII's break with Rome. Uh, Mason, who had been serving abroad for much of this period, um, and had been close to both, was suspected of having treasonously um, uh, been in correspondence with both men. And he was briefly imprisoned in the Tower in 1541, following the fallout uh, from the fall of Thomas Cromwell. Now, Mason survived, um, but in later years, his motto was said to be do and say nothing. And it was no doubt a lesson that served him well in the very different religious atmospheres of the reigns of Edward, Mary, and Elizabeth. Now, as a result of this kind of judicious silence that Mason takes up, um, historians have often struggled to kind of place him within the kind of political world of the mid-Tudor period. Was he a politique, someone willing to cast aside any religious scruples in favor of a position of prominence? Was he a Commonwealth man, um, someone who uh, had studied the classics and was concerned for the improvement and development of the nation? Or was he a Nicodemite, uh, someone who concealed their true convictions in the hopes of better times? Now, Mason's life and career remain much uh, rather understudied, and the modest aim of this project was to consider uh, one facet of his life, and that was the remnants of his library and of his reading. Mason, after all, was a great lover of books, uh, and at his death, he made plans to divide his library into three portions. 
The first and presumably largest part of his collection went to his adopted son, Anthony Wicks, who took Mason's name and went on to a public career much like uh, Mason himself. A second selection of books uh, was given to Mason's alma mater, All Souls College Oxford, uh, and a final group were given to Winchester Cathedral, uh, where Mason had served as dean in the reign of Edward VI. Now, as far as I'm aware, those books given to uh, Anthony Wicks are no longer extant, um, and so the aim of this project was uh, to see what had survived of Mason's gifts at All Souls and at Winchester Cathedral, and to ask what light they might shed on Mason's career, his mindset, uh, and on some of his travels and wider network. So, uh, what do we find? Well, so far, 26 items have been identified, uh, and these range from Greek commentaries upon the works of Aristotle, uh, to a large collection of histories and chronicles, to religious texts by the likes of the Sudurus Erasmus and Dennis the Carthusian, and finally, to a set of sort of miscellaneous volumes, including things like encyclopedias and natural history volumes. These include things like Piero Valeriano's Hieroglyphica and Guillaume Rondelet's writings on fish, which we can see on the screen here. Now, almost all of these books are in folio format, and many have lavish illustrations. This is a deluxe set of books that Mason has given to both institutions. And while Mason was by no means an intensive annotator, uh, he has left a handful of notes in certain volumes, and you can see here on the screen that in uh, next to the fishes that Rondelet has um, uh, described, Mason has uh, written in the English names of those fish. So, sort of charming use of the boy uh, book there. So, um, most of these books, 25 out of 26, in fact, um, have survived at All Souls. Mason's bequest to Winchester Cathedral must once have been considerable. The surviving cathedral accounts from 1565 to 6 um, show that the chapter spent 10 shillings carting his books up from London. Uh, and intriguingly, this collection also included a number of maps. And we know from the later accounts that the maps were framed and hung in the library, uh, and that its doors and windows, uh, of the library that is, uh, were secured and cleaned, presumably in the hopes of improving the reading conditions in the library. And I can tell you from working in uh, Winchester Cathedral, it remains quite a gloomy space to work in, so cleaning the windows would, would I'm sure, make uh, a, a big difference. Now, um, so despite my sort of extensive searches of the early 16th centuries, only one book has been thrown up in the cathedral collection, and that's an edition of the works of the historian Marcus Antonius Sabellicus. Um, uh, it seems likely that the travails of the cathedral library in the mid-17th century, when many of the books were removed from the cathedral and then returned, um, has meant that many of Mason's books have been lost. Um, but I should say that my searches are not quite complete, and I still hold out the hope of finding more. Um, but also that those searches have gone towards a broader project at Winchester Cathedral in um, uh, thinking about the provenance of those collections and the history of the library in the 16th century. And I hope to present some of that work at another point. Um, so there's more to come on that. Now, one surprising um, result of these searches um, has been to throw light uh, on one of Mason's uh, close friends, and that is the ardent evangelical physician and cleric John Warner. Now, Warner had studied with Mason at All Souls and, like him, had served as dean of Winchester Cathedral. Mason was extremely supportive of Warner. In the 1530s, he lobbied Thomas Cromwell to secure um, Warner the wardenship of All Souls, uh, and later in life, he continued to write to William Cecil, um, looking after Warner's affairs. And when Warner died in 1565, he too bequeathed books to All Souls and Winchester Cathedral, uh, mainly natural philosophy and medical texts. So I, I think we ought to be open to the possibility that this is, a, this is a gift that has been perhaps conceived together, or at least um, some thought has gone into these two institutions and how uh, both men might want to endow them. And you can see on the screen, um, it's clear that these books were entered into the library at a similar sort of time, uh, in the same hand. So they're certainly arriving at the same time. So perhaps we can see this is something of a joint gift. And, and both men were heavily involved in the governance of Oxford in the 1550s, and both almost certainly knew of Robert Horne's plans to improve the library at Winchester Cathedral. So I wonder whether this is a, a, a gift that's intended to help out with that. So uh, more broadly, what, what can we say from these books about Mason's life and career? Well, firstly, I think they can tell us something about the cultural activities of diplomats and ambassadors in this period. Early modern embassy was often a fraught and uh, a fraught experience. It involved grueling travel, poor communications, and uncertain authority. 
but it was also an opportunity to interact with local scholars, acquire books, and see the sites. In 1535, for instance, Mason was tasked with intercepting the Emperor Charles V in Sicily. Traveling down Italy's western coast, however, adver adverse winds had detained him at Naples, and so he used the time to visit the Roman ruins at Baiae, which was once a famous uh, Roman resort, uh, and he wrote a famous account which he then circulated with friends at home. But this is a bit of sightseeing that Mason takes on while he's on his trips. Writing from Valladolid the year before, he had told a friend that cloth, leather, and books be unreasonable dear, but the prices did not always to de deter him. Among his surviving books are two Greek uh, imprints, both printed in Venice, uh, and bound by the famous Venetian apple bindery studied by Miriam Foote, uh, and also known as the Fugabinder. And we can see one of the examples here, these beautiful, lavish bindings from Venice. Now, Mason passed through Venice in 1536. He was acting as secretary for Henry's ambassador there, Gregory Casale. And these texts, which are commentaries on Aristotle, were precisely what other students uh, in the Veneto, particularly at the University of Padua, were acquiring in this period. So I get the sense that Mason has either acquired this in situ or used his contacts with other English students, perhaps, to acquire a book like this later on. Now, in later years, um, Mason acted as a book agent for William Cecil uh, while serving on embassy in France in the 1550s, and he also acted as an influential supporter of English students in Paris. In 1551, he arranged for the printing of Edward Wooten's De Differentis Animalium in Paris, and he helped to acquire the royal protection uh, for this work and its printer, uh, and he possibly also showed a draft of the work to figures at the French court. And we, mo we know that Mason did give a copy of Wooten's work to All Souls, though the library's copy lacks Ma Mason's usual ex dono inscription. So it may or may not be his, uh, but certainly at one point they had Mason's copy. Uh, Mason's books were also clearly intended as a resource for his public career. And in particular, he owned histories of Byzantium, the Ottoman Empire, and ancient Rome, and had these bound with unusual material like the chronologies of Johannes Herald. Occasionally, uh, Mason left short notes in the margins of these historical works, usually in an effort to extract salient political information. So in Wolfgang Lazius's commentaries on the Roman Republic, which we can see here on the screen, um, Mason paid particular attention to a passage detailing the relationships between church and state, especially the transfer of imperial authority to Charlemagne by Pope Leo III. Now, this is clearly a passage which has some relevance to understandings of the royal supremacy, perhaps in England, and it may be that that's why Mason is gathering this information. Um, in government, Mason's skills as a reader were often in demand. Uh, in Edward VI's reign, he was asked to assemble a set of historical notes from the government's archives in an effort to uh, prove that England was superior to Scotland. And a copy of these notes later found their way to William Cecil. Sometimes, however, uh, Mason's reading could lead to less sort of um, politically comfortable solutions, uh, uh, conclusions, I should say. Uh, in the universal history of Marcus Antonius Sibelicus, now at Winchester Cathedral, uh, Mason highlighted how kings had been instituted in order that they might resist private injury with wisdom, equity, and innocence of life, and not in order that kings might exercise open robbery on the people. And this was a sentiment that suggested somehow that Kings had responsibilities and perhaps not the sort of um, absolutist supremacist uh, view that's coming out of his reading of other texts. But books could act uh, as political resources in other ways. Um, Mason, like other courtiers and counselors, uh, regularly gave books as New Year's gifts to the reigning monarch. In 1557, Mason provided Mary I with a map of England stained upon a cloth of silver in a frame of wood and a book of Spanish covered with black velvet. Likewise, in the following way, reign, Elizabeth received no fewer than seven books from Mason, including the lives of Plutarch, two books of St. Augustine's works, and several unidentified items. Now, fortunately, one of these books has survived. This is now in the Bodleian Library, and it's a copy of Plato's works in Greek that Mason likely gave to Queen Elizabeth in 1564. Now, the first thing I think that strikes us is, once again, the impressive binding by the so-called Morocco binder, who was almost certainly a Huguenot craftsman working in London in the 1560s. Uh, but it's worth saying that this book is more than just a pretty cover. Uh, in the blank pages at the front, Mason has included a short Latin inscription for the divine Elizabeth. And this is phrased as a set of prayers or wishes for the years to come. 
And these include the pious desire that the Queen would enjoy this year and many to come, and to promote justice and virtue. More controversially, however, Mason also included the wish that Elizabeth might satisfy the prayers of the good and commit herself to marriage. Coming less than a year after Parliament had petitioned the Queen to marry, a petition that didn't go down very well with the Queen herself, uh, Mason clearly viewed the book as an opportunity to offer counsel by other means. But there are also signs, I think, that um, uh, elements of public service could take their toll. Mason, uh, in his copy of Erasmus's paraphrases, took a particular interest in the paraphrase of John, and especially the paraphrase on the chapters uh, 18 and 19 of that gospel, and this is where Christ is arrested and taken to his crucifixion. Now, the majority of Mason's interventions uh, in this book appear devotional in nature. Christ's deeds and actions were a particular focus. He highlighted how Christ came uh, forward to meet Judas at Gethsemane, and Christ's meekness on his way to the cross. Uh, and he read the, uh, he read the work with the scriptures in mind, or possibly even with uh, a Bible to hand, for many of the notes record the biblical verses on which Erasmus is writing. And intriguingly, uh, many of these seem to be closer to the Vulgate rather than Erasmus's uh, improved text, even though Erasmus often cites his own text. Mason seems to be recalling an older Vulgate text there. Um, but running through Erasmus's paraphrase, um, is the theme, uh, uh, are the themes of truth, betrayal, and courtly conduct. When, for instance, Peter denies Christ, Erasmus linked the story to those who attach themselves to the courts of princes and whose first assertion is to deny Christ, that is, to deny truth. Mason, perhaps sensitive to his own bargains with earthly powers, made sure to highlight the sentiment. He also underlined Erasmus's contention that Jesus' actions during his arrest and trial demonstrated that on behalf of truth, one must, always, uh, must indeed speak forcefully. Mason had reflected similarly upon the effects of power on political speech in a letter of 1534, commenting on the recent Berlin marriage. Every man swear now in verba reges and reginae, he said, and those who refuse are immediately sent to the tower. Now, I'm not suggesting somehow that Mason's notes in his paraphrase are a kind of explicit comment on the Berlin marriage, um, but I do think that they offer an insight uh, into the mindset of someone who spent their career navigating the dangerous politics of the mid-16th century, both at home and abroad. Here is someone, I think, who had learnt the hard way to do and say nothing. Uh, but I hope also that this paper has um, demonstrated that Mason was more uh, than just a taciturn political survivor. His library can tell us much about the desire of scholar statesmen to endow colleges and cathedrals with suitable books and maps. They can reveal something of the cultural life uh, of those sent to serve the crown abroad, and they offer windows into the processes of political thinking and counsel in mid-Tudor England. If nothing else, uh, I'm certain that Mason's eye for books, his love of lavish illustration, of beautiful bindings, and the efforts he took to acquire these books will endear him to the society's members. Thanks ever so much. Okay, moving now seamlessly from the early modern period to modernism. <laughs> okay. um, I'd like to begin by echoing my fellow speakers in thanking you for being here today and of course for the invitation to speak to you um, about my research on the Egos Press and the Networks of Modernist Print, which the Bibliographical Society generously supported with a grant in the name of Barry Bloomfield. The Egos Press was an early 20th century small press um, that originally emerged out of the Egos magazine, which you see here on the left. This was a literary magazine uh, which had in turn developed out of Dora Marsden's radical feminist painter, The Free Woman, which over time had increasingly become associated with modernist poets like Ezra Pound, Richard Aldington, H.D. and T.S. Eliot, and prose writers like James Joyce and Wyndham Lewis. In 1915, the magazine's main editor, Harriet Shaw Weaver, launched a new small press venture, which initially functioned as a sort of book pub publishing arm of the periodical. So it provided an additional publishing platform for the work of these poets and novelists associated with the egoist in book form. 
We see some of these books here on the right. But the very first publication of the Egoist Press is actually a series of six small pamphlets called the Poets Translation Series. This was issued under the general editorship of the magazine's then literary editor, Richard Arlington. The Poets Translation Series was first announced in the Egoist magazine in August 1915 with the following statement. The object of the editors of the series is to present a number of translations of Greek and Latin poetry and prose, especially of those authors who are less frequently given in English. This literature has too long been the property of pedagogues, philologists, and professors. Its human qualities have been obscured by the wranglings of grammarians, who love it principally because to them it is so safe and so dead. By contrast to these pedagogues and grammarians, the poet Allington proposed that classical literature was very much alive and that its appreciation as poetry could indeed help to improve the standards of modern verse. And he sought to prove this point with a set of six rather free translations of the classics by eagerest associated poets who rendered the Greek of Sappho and the Latin of Asonius not only into English, but more specifically into the modernist poetic idiom of imagism. And this proposition that classical literature was a living body of work that formed part of the contemporary discussion around avant-garde poetry was not only reflected in the contents of the poet's translation series, but also in the chosen format. The announcement uh, continues. We do not deny that there are many good translations in English of classical writers, but too often such works are lonely and austerely expensive. The Poets' Translation Series will appear first in The Egoist, starting September 1st, and will then be reprinted and issued a small pamphlet, simple and inexpensive, so that none will buy except to read. This last phrase, so that none will buy except to read, seems to me very important. While we might imagine the lonely and austerely expensive tomes alluded to in the announcement gathering dust on the shelves of the collector, the cheap pamphlets in the Poets' Translation series were quite explicitly intended to be read and reread, and then perhaps passed on or discarded. They were designed to facilitate the circulation and active discussion of an evolving poetic discourse, not as beautiful monuments to a dead literature. And if we look now at the pamphlets themselves, we can see that this design attention has been exactly carried into practice. So the pamphlets have a very plain paper cover. The text is simple and unadorned. And in fact, it appears exactly as it had previously appeared in the columns of the Egoist magazine. And since the pamphlets were printed by the same firm as the magazine at the time, it seems highly likely to me that the printers simply reused the type that had already been set up for the magazine and so saved themselves the labor of having to reset the text. And through this um, economy, of production, the um, sales price of the pamphlets could also be kept very low. The cheapest title in the series cost two pence, the most expensive six pence, and a whole set of six pamphlets could be had for just two shillings. All in all then, these pamphlets were clearly published in a format that doesn't encourage the aesthetic appreciation of the printed object, but simply gets the text to the reader at the cheapest price possible. And this somewhat utilitarian attitude towards print which considers the book primarily as a vehicle for the circulation of literature, rather than as an aesthetically valuable object, object in and of itself, is something that generally um, distinguishes Weaver's approach from that of other modernist small press publishers. For many modernist small presses at least started as amateur printing ventures, so where the artists physically crafted their own books, the Egoist Press relied on commercial printers from the outset where the typical small press displayed a certain amount of attention to the book as a material object, the egoist press seem, seemed uninterested in the aesthetics of print and was primarily concerned with the objective of, of putting experimental modern writing into literature, sorry, into circulation. <laughs> uh, however, there are certain exceptions to this rule. And one of these is the post-war reboot of the Poets Translation series with a second set of pamphlets that were now published in quite a different format. If we look at this announcement here, the first thing we notice is the rather steep increase in price. So where two shillings could previously buy you the entire set of six pamphlets, 
two shillings was now the price of the cheapest individual volume, with the full second set being priced at one pound. In a prospectus from July 1919, um, Weaver addresses this sharp price increase, stating, while we are compelled to charge more to cover the cost of material, we have decided to issue larger, work and to clo larger works and to clothe them in a more permanent binding. A second prospectus um, similarly addresses the change in the series physical format. So, noting, in future beginning with number seven, the pamphlets will have a detachable paper cover to keep them clean for permanent binding. What interests me here is the introduction of this idea of permanence now as a desirable quality. Apparently, the second set of the poet's translation series would no longer consist of flimsy, inexpensive pamphlets that none will buy except to read, but rather of small books that were meant to be kept and enjoyed for their material as well as their literary qualities. And again, we see this also reflected in the books themselves. Each title in the new set now has an attractively designed cover evoking the colors of the Greek flag, featuring large Roman capitals and a decorative satyr emblem. The rather squat appearance of the first set has now been superseded by a taller, more well-proportioned format. And regarding the text, we notice that the haphazard aesthetic of the reprinted magazine column has been replaced by the pleasing typography of a carefully designed book page. The contrast between the first and second set of Poets' translation series is certainly striking, and so we might ask what lies behind this apparent change in the Ego Espresso's attitude towards the format of their books. And I want to suggest that one significant factor in this was the influence of the printers they had engaged to, to produce the second set of pamphlets, and that was a London-based firm called the Pelican Press. The Pelican Press was a commercial printing business founded in 1916 by the printer and typographer Francis Maynell. Uh, Maynell is now better known for his later venture in modern fine printing, the Nonsuch Press, but the early pe earlier Pelican Press, although less well known, is certainly just as deserving of our attention. This was essentially a jobbing press, so it printed posters, catalogues, brochures, pamphlets, magazines, and sometimes also entire books, um, for a broad range of commercial customers. But it was also a rather atypical jobbing press in that it aimed to introduce the close attention to high quality printing and typographical design, usually associated with fine printing, into the jobbing business. In the words of Francis Maynell, the Pelican Press aimed to provide good printing for the daily, not the exceptional purpose. And we can clearly see this principle at work in this beautiful specimen sheet that the Pelican Press issued in 1921. It showcases some of the decorative borders and revived historic typefaces that the Pelican Press put at the disposal of their customers. And if we look at the examples of fine poster work in the middle, we also get a good sense of the broad range of customers they serve. So from the fishmongers Mac Fisheries, who were advertising good fish sold quickly, to art galleries, from churches to concert venues, and of particular interest to us, if you look at the image on the right, we also find the title page for Jean Cocteau's Cock and Harlequin, a book published by the Egoist Press in 1921, right next to an advertisement for a home decoration store called Sintra, based in Hampstead Heath. This mixing of modernist art with advertising matter, all packaged in the aesthetic vocabulary of fine printing, um, struck me as very interesting and so I wanted to look a little bit closer at the books that the Pelican Press had printed for the Egos Press. And besides the already mentioned second set of the Poets' Translation series, these also included these two um, poetry collections by the American poets Marion Moore and H.D., both published in 1921. And as I looked at these books in the context of the Pelican Press's other work, I noticed quite a close visual analog to the aesthetic of these modernist poetry collections in a pamphlet called The Craft of Printing. This little book, um, although at first glance it appears to be a historical treatise on the craft of printing, was actually more um, of a pro promotional pamphlet for the work of the Pelican Press. Indeed, Francis Maynell once described it as a special kind of advertising, 
which offered historical and aesthetic dissertations before the inevitable self-praise. And then as I looked further, I came across an even closer visual analog with um, this pamphlet here, entitled These Hard Times, Present Day Problems for the Advertiser. And this booklet, which is bound, as you can see, in exactly the same cover paper as Marianne Moore's poems, is a short treatise aimed at marketing professionals on the pitfalls of buying advertising space. So again, we find this curious mixing of two seemingly incongruous cultural registers, the visual e equation of the experimental, uh, of experimental modernist poetry with the discourse of commercial advertising, all presented in the same fine printing aesthetic of the Pelican Press. So what are we to make of this? Well, instead of a preliminary conclusion, I want to end my talk with the question that this raises for me in my research. And that's the question whether, as the publications of the EOS Press gained in material attractiveness, something else might not have been lost. Whether plain and inexpensive little pamphlets in the original poet's translation series that none would buy except to read highlighted the text and the reader's intellectual engagement with it, the beautifully produced volumes printed by the Pelican Press encouraged an appreciation of the book not just as a vehicle of text, but as an aesthetically valu valuable object in and of itself. Yet, if this beautiful object um, is such that the lines between art and advertising become increasingly blurred, we might ask if its function as a vehicle of probing intellectual discourse has not receded a little too far into the background. The question, what is the proper format for the publication of experimental avant-garde literature is one to which modernist small press publishers like the Egos Press provided a variety of answers. And the way in which these answers were shaped and influenced by other actors in the contemporary book world, such as the Pelican Press, is I believe a topic that deserves our continued scholarly attention. Thank you. That, that was wonderful. Thank you very much, um, Elise, Tim, Evie. Um, what a wonderful demonstration of the variety of bibliographical projects that the society supports and very much wants to continue supporting. Um, before we open the floor to questions and also questions online, I was wondering what would um, John Mason have thought of the books from the Egoist Press, which none, so that none will buy except to read. I mean, he was clearly a bibliophile. He liked large, or at least from the evidence of the surviving books, he liked large illustrated folios. And those two bindings you showed us were stunning. Um, so those were not necessarily just bought to read. Um, and then my special thanks to Elise for showing me something that I now covet. I personally like binding, printed binding, manuscript and printed binding ways. And I long to find an un, a sort of a waste sheet of that calendar in 128 Mo, was it? I mean, extraordinary. The book must be, show me with your fingers, what does? Yeah. Oh, you could. Oh, oh, sorry. For those online, we're just waiting for a microphone. Oh, I think this is there. working actually. Oh, there we go. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, the book on 120, but it was, it was a gift, um, I think, to Moretus for New Year's. Um, and I know that there are examples of bound 128 mos, but I don't know if this this one in particular was ever bound. But it's really fascinating thinking about like the I intricacies. Think you could of, envision. A, yeah, ab absolutely. Be I'm sure it would be like tiny, ri tiny ridiculously, tiny. unreadably tiny. Yeah, surely. And you'd have to be bound so tightly that there's no way you yes, could no, really you read any of the text. It'd be all gutter. But as as an unfolded, uncut sheet, yeah. it's absolutely it's wonderful. spectacular. 
So thank you all for those things. Now questions. Uh, we just have to do this systematically with a microphone. And if anyone um, joining us online has questions, um, please use the chat function. And um, Stephanie is, is watching for those. Giles. Uh, thank you very much indeed for all three of those. Um, I had a question for Elise. And I also, if I'm allowed to have two questions, I had one for Tim. Is that allowed? Um, the question for Elise was uh, about the counterfeit editions. And it's how, how do you tell which, whether, whether the counterfeit editions are being aimed at Dutch Catholics or being aimed at the export market. Um, yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Well, try, so why don't answer you answer first? that? Oh, okay, no, great. Yeah, thank you. That's such, that's such a wonderful question. Um, and I think that, that the sort of dominant narrative that you see in the historiography is very much that books are being printed in the South and shipped to the North for the Dutch Catholics. And that, um, I, but I think they also definitely went in the other direction. But it's with these counterfeits, it's really hard to tell. Really, the best evidence we have, because not many of them like survive very well, so some of the best evidence we have that they existed in the first place is that Balthazar Moritas complains about them endlessly, and that other sort of, um, you know, sort of printers in Amsterdam are complaining that they exist, and the consistory is complaining that they exist. But like, I, I've, I found very few actual surviving examples of them, which is really fascinating, or perhaps I just like don't, don't know that they're counterfeits, or they haven't been described as such. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's a question of sort of supply and availability. Um, I think that you'll see um, in sort of their, their sort of specific dedications related to the Dutch mission, there are some, some really subtle examples of, of that it may be directed, you know, the focus on sort of local Dutch, specifically Dutch saints from the Middle Ages. So Willibard and Boniface are sort of the two emblems of the sort of Dutch Catholic mission. So if you see a particular emphasis on those things in the liturgical books, then sometimes that's an indication, but otherwise it's really difficult to tell. Other other <laughs> questions. Uh, Karen. Keith, just wait a minute. Is that <laughs> no no? Thank you. Um, and so my question really for Tim's in a way more of a methodological question because I wasn't quite clear from what you said when you, uh, you were describing Mason's library as being divided by his will, whether he said anything about either quantities or types of book that he intended for one or other institution or indeed for his adopted son, um, or whether the institutions themselves had listed the books as they arrived, or whether you were entirely dependent on in those ex dono inscriptions. Um, if the latter, uh, um, it may well be that they only bothered to put them in the folios and didn't put them in the smaller books. Um, but I'd be interested to know a bit more. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's um, uh, it's a really, it's a really good point. Um, so uh, the will does not say the proportions of the library, but it does say that um, uh, he gives to his son Anthony um, his remaining library, except for those portions that he has set aside for Winchester Cathedral and All Souls College, which is why my what sort of working assumption is that um, Anthony Wicks gets the larger proportion of those and then a smaller set are set aside for All Souls. And given the nature of the surviving books as, as lavish, often quite impressively bound volumes, I get the sense that there's some kind of discernment has been made about the types of books that he would like to give to those two institutions and what would be best for those two libraries. Um, in the case of Winchester Cathedral, we have no list of um, uh, uh, donations from uh, that period, so we're entirely reliant on the ex dono inscriptions, and some of the work that we're trying to do is to work through to see what can be figured out from the physical forms of the books, from things like four edge numbers, about books that were in the library in the 16th century. So that's part of the wider project that this has, has led on to. In the case of All Souls, they do have a vellum catalogue which lists some of the books in, although it doesn't always list who gave them. Um, and so we have um, 
we have a list. Uh, we know, for instance, that uh, one book by Cyprian Leovitz, uh, another historical work, has, been, has now been lost. Um, and indeed, the, the Wooten uh, book may well be the one that's in All Souls, or it may have, have been lost in time. And again, it's, it's not a huge number of books. It's something like, um, it, it's not far off the sort of 25, 26 um, numbers of books. So we haven't lost loads from All Souls, but clearly that's the size of the gift being given. Uh, Meg and then Keith, did you have a question as well? A question for Evie. So you see, uh, I, I quite like the fact that they, you know, the first iteration of Egoist Press were, were printed for readers, and I wondered what sort of evidence you found of early readers of those particular, um, you know, the first series. Thank you. Um, I have to say, in the pamphlets themselves, none. <laughs> the ones that I looked at in the British Library are completely pristine, so presumably they were deposited there before they ever got to any readers. <laughs> um, but where I would look, uh, and actually thank you for giving me that idea, <laughs> um, is in the Egoist magazine, I suppose, to see if people um, write letters to the editor and talk about reading those pamphlets, um, which I'm now definitely going to do. Thank you. <laughs> Another question for uh, Tim, um, and that's the uh, gift to Queen Elizabeth binding. Uh, I'd like to know how large the book was, what uh, size the book was of that, to give an idea. I've got a second question as well. Um, and, and another question on the binding, uh, and that was the apple uh, binder binding. Uh, the motif in the middle, do you know what that relates to? The those are two questions. So, yeah, I can give you some sort of short answers to that. So the, the book to uh, Elizabeth is in folio format again, so it's another large, lavish volume. So again, this sense that Mason is quite discerning with the books that he wants. Yes, re yeah, exactly, yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's quite, it's quite um, bashed up now, but clearly in its time it would have been a really impressive and, and lavish object. Um, and exactly the kind of thing that would have worked well as a New Year's gift because it has this beautiful cover and then it has this sort of surprise political message inside. And whether or not Elizabeth ever, ever sees that message is, is a, another point altogether. But yeah, um, I, I don't know what the, um, uh, that's a great question. and I don't know what the motive is and I will go away and have a look. Um, uh, yes, so I, I, can't, I can't answer that at the moment. But yes, it's a, it's a good point. In, in the book trade, we call that wonderful, original, untouched condition. <laughs> um, other questions in the room, or perhaps we have some online. Yeah, so we've got one online for Evie. Um, so Robert's asked, surely any new publications appearing in the war year of 1915 must have been subject to some sort, some more economy measures of some sort, regardless of the wishes of the authors. <laughs> um, so he said, surely any new publications appearing in the war year of 1915 must have been subject to some war economy measures of some sort, regardless of the wishes of the authors. Thank you, yes, um, I'm sure that will have been the case. I suppose what I would say to that is that with the second set that's specifically thematized by Weaver, that sort of after the war, the cost of material has gone up um, exponentially and then her solution or her response to that um, was to change the format to kind of make it worth for the readers that <laughs> um, at least they, they got something for their money. Um, so I would take that then to mean that there is perhaps more than uh, authorial or publishing intention behind the the planar format of the first edition, which was probably um, well, yes produced under similar economic constraints, um, but nevertheless we see that there was a, a different way of responding to those as well. Any anything else online? All right. 
Uh, Liz? You have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If I can be super presumptuous, I actually have questions for both of my co-panelists. Just your papers were so interesting. First of all, for Tim, um, I'm really curious. So you, I, this, this marginalia you mentioned is really fascinating. I'm wondering, uh, are there, in these books, are there only marginalia in Mason's hand, or are there marginalia in other hands? Like, is it possible any of them could have been bought secondhand, or you could, there could have been other readers? Uh, no, not that I've found. Um, uh, in general, it's just Mason. I mean, he's not a he's not a big annotator, and he has a sort of notoriously bad hand. Uh, and actually, the examples I showed you there are quite are quite clear, but it's notoriously difficult to read. Um, uh, one of the um, Penry Williams, who's sort of mid Tudor specialist, used to sort of say that you know if he would he would love a study on Mason if only he could convince a graduate student to work with their handwriting and the surviving letters. So. Um, my sense is it's only Mason, and because they go straight from Mason to an institutional setting, um, actually, they, there's no sense that they've really been used that much. Um, although all souls do rebound a large number of them in the in the late 16th century, so there's a sense in which uh, maybe they are being used. Yeah. The Aquinas problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, and for Evie, um, just a really simple question. Um, it, for this first ephem super ephemeral run of the Poe's translation, like how do we know, do we have, do we know how many survive? And also where are they? Like who are the weirdos that ended up preserving them intentionally? Um, I haven't come across any, um, in, well, to be fair, I haven't looked <laughs> very um, intently yet, but um, I, I'm not, I wouldn't expect to find very many of them surviving simply because, you know, because that wasn't really the point, right, because of their ephemerality. Um, so I suppose I can count myself lucky that they did deposit a set in the British Library so I can look at them now and see what they were like. Um, but, yeah, I would, it's not the kind of um, object one comes across otherwise. <laughs> but, yeah, thank you. Any, any other questions? online or in the room. Well, then let me just thank our three speakers enormously. I mean, I think of that as a kind of delicious tasting menu. Um, and I hope you will all come back as your work continues and speak to us again. Uh, there's clearly a, a big appetite here, and we will continue to see how your, how your research develops. So please join me in, in thanking Elise, Tim, and Evie for a really enjoyable afternoon. Um, I hope these discussions will continue. There are drinks offered next door, so please join us all there. <laughs>